I would like to thank everybody for joining us again for uh, one more panel. And uh, every panel we have is on a very interesting and critical topic. But I think there is really no more critical topic than the topic of maritime education and the topic of uh, providing incentives to the younger generation for choosing uh, a career as a seafarer. Uh, we have with us uh, a terrific panel. Uh, George Waldo Michalis uh, is going to be moderating it. George, you all know George, he is an expert moderator. Uh, and uh, we have uh, institutions that will cover every uh, aspect of the uh, maritime uh, industry, of the uh, maritime education uh, process. And also we have uh, Vasilis uh, Papayanopoulos with us, who will provide, uh, if you want, the ship owner perspective. So uh, I will not introduce the panelists. I will leave that to George. I would like to thank you all. and. Uh, George, if you can let us know how everybody is fitting in the puzzle, because everyone is representing a different type of maritime education, but all together, it's the whole package of uh, maritime education. So thank you again to everybody for being with us. Thank you, Nicholas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, pa fellow panelists, welcome. Uh, as we are limited in time, I will very briefly introduce um, the panelists. We have Basis Papayanopoulos. Uh, representing uh, Common Progress, uh, Principal of Common Progress, ship owners. Um, three professors with us, uh, Professors Dinos Arkumanis, uh, Professor Golias, and Professor Tambaikis. Um, all of them with a very uh, elaborate uh, academic career um, and active in maritime education, uh, both in terms of more hands-on and in terms of more theoretical um, aspects. Um, and of course, Venetia Kalipolitu, um, who is a professional uh, education and training advisor with a very large uh, shipping company, Tsakos, um, and who has uh, a background uh, in uh, the Hellenic Coast Guard. Uh, and I think that she will bring some interesting views to our discussion. What we're going to try and do today is, in the short time we have, is cover and address a number of topics um, that concern maritime education. We have uh, selected a few questions and topics for all participants to comment on, and hopefully we'll have some discussion. And of course, if there are any questions uh, from the floor, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A um, function uh, to pose them, and hopefully we'll have time to get to them. Um, we're not starting in any particular order, um, apart from the order that uh, Capital Link put the panelists on the, uh, in the panel and published the agenda. So I will start with uh, Vasilis uh, Papayanopoulos. Vasili, um, for better or worse, you represent the younger, with in quotation mark, generation of ship owners. Um, and I would like to know, do you feel that you received a maritime education? And if not, why? And do you think it's important for our industry to receive such an education? Thank you very much, George. I'd like to think it's for the better. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Pornosis and all of the Capital Link team for putting this conference together. They have consistently been highlighting uh, maritime education. I think that's very important. Um, and so I'm very happy to be a part of this today. And um, thank you very much for your support and assistance during the past years. Uh, so going to your question, um, I did get a, a maritime education by doing a postgraduate degree in, uh, in Cass Business School in London, where we had many excellent professors like Professor Tamvakis, who is on the panel today. And uh, I remember fondly how he gave us some invaluable classes on derivatives and their uses as uh, hedging tools. And generally, I, it was a very useful course, which uh, gave us a very good and concise overview of what it is like to work in the shipping business and an overview of the working of maritime related businesses and shipping businesses. And so I may not be entirely unbiased when I answer your second question about whether the idea of having a focused maritime, maritime education is outdated. I don't believe that it is. So having said uh, that, we all know shipping requires a lot of on the job learning. And also that's the case with many other industries. 
and some of what is taught in academic courses can also be learned in practice. And at the same time, it is true that some of what is learned in practice cannot be taught or replicated in a classroom. And I am sure we all know cases with diverse educational backgrounds that have had nothing to do with shipping to begin with. And then they, they came into the industry and they have had very successful careers. So I don't think that it is an impossible fit at all, far from it. However, I, it might mean that there is a steeper learning curve involved for people that don't have a maritime background, or it might mean that it will take longer to attain the overview one gets through the academic approach. So I think it is important to have a targeted shipping education. I think it helps, not least because maritime business has various peculiarities. Uh, we are all familiar with some of those. I mean, the fact that a lot of shipping operations are conducted at sea, at sea or in ports and not onshore like most industries. And also the fact that it is a globalized business with a broad geographical scope. And all this increases complexity, it increases uncertainty, and it means different set of skills are required in different levels of the business. So one needs a broad understanding of many different aspects, <laughs> technical, legal, financial, or other. And that would explain why there are some targeted maritime management courses that have been extremely successful, such as the CAS Business School STF course I mentioned before. Thank you, Vasilis. Professor Golias, apart from being, of course, a professor at the National Technical University of Athens, you head the Scientific uh, Research and Publications Department of the Evgenidis Foundation. The Evgenidis Foundation has a very long history and tradition of providing not only the means of financial assistance, assistance and creative solutions and research and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, efforts targeted uh, towards the Greek maritime education efforts, but mainly centered, uh, at least historically, uh, on the work of the Naval Academies, Coast Guard, etc. here in Greece. Um, do you consider the Avianidis Foundation and your, uh, the role that the Foundation plays an integral part of the public education process here in Greece? Uh, and how do you uh, view the privately operated educational facilities in Greece? Thank you, Mr. President, and I'd like to thank uh, Captain Link and uh, personally Nicholas and Olga Bornozzi for giving you Genidis Foundation and me personally the chance to express our views in this very interesting uh, topic. Uh, also, I'm, uh, I'd like to say I'm very glad I'm participating in this session with these uh, distinguished uh, uh, participants. So I'll go directly now to your question. The Foundation has established during the last decades an protagonistic role in Greek maritime education. And this is not only due to the fact that, uh, uh, that it produces high, high quality material, more than 100, 120,000 books per year, not only due to financial assistance to, the, to educational needs, but also due to the fact that it has a very active involvement in all issues related to Medicine Marine in Greece. Um, in this context, the foundation was assigned lately from the Ministry of Maritime Affairs, the mission to formulate a strategy for the new institutional framework for maritime education and to define all the required main axles towards this goal. It goes without saying that this institutional framework includes also private education in the maritime sector. You said the Engineers Foundation, its perennial course, has supported the public maritime education. That's true, but this is due to the fact that uh, there was an institutional absence of private initiatives in this area until lately. However, the foundation equally welcomes private education, is ready to cooperate with educators, educational entities that would give to uh, Greek citizens alternative ways to acquire knowledge and skills that lead to Greek certificates of competence. But it's obvious that uh, educational programs, all educational procedures should be approved and monitored the same way for public and private education entities. And furthermore, that uh, all graduates from private and public uh, sectors should uh, undergo common performance tests under the auspices of the Minister of Maritime Affairs to get the, uh, the certificates of competence. Thank you, Professor Golias. Uh, interestingly, we move on to Professor Arkumanis and following on from what, Mr. From what Professor Golias said, um, Professor Arkumanis, you've, had, uh, you've left a global footprint in your academic career. Um, and recently, a few years ago, you have headed the um, committee of a private maritime educational facility here in Greece. One of the first ones, if not the first one of its sort here in Greece. 
Um, and I was wondering where, how you see private education in generally, in general for maritime education, and if you see, uh, at least in Greece, an interest from the younger generation for such educations, both shipboard and shore-based, given the fact that your institution uh, provides both shore-based and shipboard uh, educations. To, to answer to this question, we may have to look at the factors that are affecting the decision of young people, uh, such as family tradition, social status, uh, gender, academic achievement, personality, and so on. And uh, what we have seen, and there are some reviews of that issue, that show the people, the young people that go to maritime academies have less of a family tradition than those that attend academic maritime studies. In terms of gender, the maritime academies are more male dominated uh, compared to maritime studies that it's almost half and half. Academically, it, it's, it, it's difficult to, to comment, but probably the, the students that go to the Maritime Academy are slightly weaker academically than those that attend the, the academic programs. And this could be an issue as we move into a more technologically dominated shipping. Um, but we may come back to that. Personality, is always very important and we know the experiences from the sea service and it's sad to see the publicity that has been attracted during the pandemic about the crew who couldn't go back to the families uh, isolated in uh, for months uh, uh, far away and that may not help uh, young people to to be attracted to uh, go to maritime academies. So I'll, I'll thank you, Professor. We'll, we'll come back. It's interesting because one of the questions we have, I'll put it out to you, to all of you now, um, is that there are a number of Greeks uh, that follow um, shipboard uh, maritime education uh, paths, whether publicly or privately provided, but they end up not going to sea. We'll, go, we'll get back to that, and it touches upon what you said, Professor Arkumanis, and what you said, Professor Goyas, and I'm sure what Venetia will tell us in a little bit. But prior to going to Venetia, Professor Tambaikis, um, you as well have left a global footprint in your academic career. Uh, where you are now, you provide a postgraduate, a master's degree uh, in shore-based maritime education. Uh, Vasilis is a graduate, I believe, of your school, as he said, and he had you as a professor. I hope he was a good student. Um, uh, he was, right? Okay. Um, now at, uh, at uh, CAS, or as you call it now, City University, because I'm not sure what the politically correct terminology is. Anymore. We're not sure either. So just, uh, Okay, so I'll call it CAS because I'm, I, I remember it as CAS. So at CAS, um, you offer studies which are uh, centered on a number of uh, topics uh, and themes, finance, shipping, uh, et cetera, commodities. Is this something that you believe has become an integral part of maritime education? Um, and is it the way forward? Meaning, will we look at this more on a high level or do we need the practical approach as well? I think we need a combination of both. I think the whole idea of what we offer, which back in the 1980s, perhaps at the time was pioneering, now it's de facto you require context that's all we offer so yes we operate in the maritime world or our graduates operate in the maritime world not all all of them but most of them i would say but you need to understand how the world economy works how commodities work because this is what drives the vast majority of the shipping market so you cannot go out there and discuss for example about the tanker sector without not knowing how energy works how energy changes which is probably the sector that is facing the most dramatic changes right now. So it's a combination of specific education, like the topics you mentioned, but also some more transferable skills. 
So you still need the analytics, the business analytics, your statistics, your accounting, your finance, your, you know, whatever is relevant basically to treat shipping as a business. Now, from my perspective, this is only one part of the puzzle that makes up maritime education. You need everyone at every level. That's how shipping works. And I think the way that shipping progresses, you need the people who are more on the practical operational side of the business to be aware of these issues, perhaps not to this sort of depth, but they need to be aware of the management and the business issues. And indeed, at the other end, the people who are on the management side, they need to understand the sort of on the ground operational issues that somebody faces on a ship. So I think a blending of both or the coexistence of both uh, is, is absolutely important for any business to work as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Professor Dambakis. Venetia, I've left you last, not because you should be last, but because what we have established in the comments by the prior four panelists is number one, that uh, there needs to be a coexistence of both private and public maritime education. There needs to be both the practical side and the academic side. There needs to be understanding, as Professor Tambaki said, from both sides of the other side. And now I come to you because you belong to a considerably large, if not one of the largest organizations in shipping. You manage a diversified fleet. Um, you have a very long presence in, in this uh, business uh, and a very well-respected name. And the founder of the business has decided to establish a nautical high school. Um, for those of us who remember, nautical high schools 50, 60, 70 years ago were the norm in many places in Greece, and then they slowly disappeared. So here comes a well-experienced uh, uh, and large ship owner who re-establishes a nautical high school. Why do you think such a person feels the need to create this type of facility? Um, and shouldn't this not be done by private or public enterprise? Should this not be a private enterprise, a private nautical high school, or even a government-run uh, public um, high school? Um, and are we doing this or are you doing this because there's something missing? And to be honest with you, this, your position, your comments on this will also, I think, uh, answer to an extent the question posed by one of the uh, uh, viewers uh, from the floor, which is, okay, so all of these people go to nautical academies. Why don't all of them go to sea and very few of them? Benetia. Thank you, Giorgo. Uh, allow me, first of all, to congratulate and thank, sincerely thank uh, Nicolas Bornozis for this opportunity. And I'm truly honored to be among uh, all these distinguished participants. Going directly to your question, it is actually a moral responsibility to the society. And for us, it's a tribute to the Greek maritime tradition. And in the foremost, it's a best practice for the future, and I will explain myself. As you said, Maria Chacos Public Benefit Foundation established in 2018 the first private non-profit vocational nautical high school in Greece, of course, located in Ichios, the so-called TINS, Chacos and Health Education Nautical School. TINS is the brainchild of Captain Panagiotis Chacos. What we have envisaged is to be a school unit as nucleus of education, knowledge, and excellence, which shall prepare and nurture the tender age of 15, the pupils to become one day what for Greece, the leaders that the Greek seamanship needs. It is a unique example, a seapoining group to put its own resources on the line to enhance maritime education for young people. And we warmly welcome call the shipping community to follow it. TINS actually draws multiple benefits from its direct link to the Chacos group. It helps the school keep its ear close to the ground and adjust courses to latest shipping developments and requirements where marine practice is in the forefront with our training vessels available to students. We provide a supplementary program to nautical education. Due to the limitation of time, allow me only to mention a very uh, a great effort that made from the Ministry of Shipping. Most recently, it legislated the promotion of the nautical high school graduates to masters and chief engineers. 
following a blended training program of seagoing vessel service and courses, which has been warmly accepted, not only by the shipping community, but also from young people that they didn't manage to enter in the Mersan Marine Academy. Our congratulations and respect to Mr. Plakidakis. We have witnessed the significant increase of adult applicants. We have prepared a special education program. The sea is endless, so if there are youngers that could not manage to enter an academy, should be a way to find them and offer them generously the opportunity for a career at sea. Definitely the authorities could contribute to this mission. We visit uh, West Macedonia, where we certify, identify significant percentage of unemployment. There are schools that are preparing electrical and mechanical engineers at all levels. In this area, where we will have the post lignite era, Greece has prepared the just transition fund. Here, with this opportunity, we can find a key set of actions and activities regarding maritime employment and education. Closing my small intervention, allow me to say that this is not a field of competition regarding provision of services, training services. is a complement, an enhancement to public and private education. With this in mind, I truly invite all of you, the next time that we'll meet, to discuss for maritime training and education centers of excellence in Greece. Thank you, George, for your patience. Thank you, Venetia. So we see that we have public, private, and hybrid. Everybody needs to help each other. We need education that starts at a very young age, goes on to uh, the Naval Academies, private or public, and on to the postgraduate um, studies. With that in mind, uh, Vasily, you're a ship owner. You have a maritime education. Uh, uh, what do you think is tomorrow's areas that we need to, that the industry and we need to focus on to be able to meet the challenges? Thank you, George. First off, uh, it's interesting because this is precisely the question that the four year long European Skills Project that started in 2019 is trying to answer. So Mr. Golias and the Avianidis Foundation who are coordinating these efforts, I'm sure can tell us a lot about that. Uh, but as far as I know, this initiative precisely aims to identify which maritime skills are needed for the future and to produce the educational packages to cover these skills. Uh, I can talk regarding the challenges we face as, as an industry, and I believe the main ones to be environmental, technological, and economic. Sorry about that. Um, so we are daily faced as shipping professionals with the challenge of how to transfer goods and people safely and environmentally in a way that is economically viable. So I believe maritime education should be geared towards assisting the industry in overcoming these challenges, along with challenges posed by technologies being introduced on board ships and onshore that require new sets of skills from seafarers. So we need to be able to equip officers and seafarers with such skills. Uh, we have digitalization and uh, information technologies as well as cybersecurity that are becoming inc increasingly relevant. Automation is used a lot in day-to-day -day operations, although at the moment we are still far away, as far as I can tell, from fully automated ocean-going vessels. Maritime law has always been very important, and I believe it will be more so in the future. Uh, and, also, and the same goes for naval architecture and marine engineering, which should also be geared at the highest level towards the development of new technologies that are environmentally sustainable. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we are faced with very real shortages of skills, of skilled and capable seagoing personnel. There exists a pressing need to increase the capacity of Greek and European maritime academies in order to produce more high quality officers. Uh, some of what uh, Mrs. Kalipolitu just mentioned, I think, uh, are very good initiatives because it seems that, that less and less men and women choose the seafaring profession as their preferred career path, and even less uh, end up following it finally. So this represents a big challenge for Greek and European shipping, 
and we need to identify the reasons for this and try to remedy them. And to that effect, I think a lot of the insights that the professors and Ms. Kalipolitu gave us will be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Vasily. Professor Golias, um, I will change the question a bit that I had originally planned on asking you, especially in view of what Vasily said. Um, I was originally going to ask you, as the Eugenides Foundation has analyzed the views of the young Greeks and the students, etc., uh, I was going to ask you, what do you feel that marriage, maritime education, if you feel that maritime education is a sought-after alternative, shore-based and, and ship-based? But what I would like to do now, since you said that you are now actively, as the Foundation, involved with the uh, Greek state in setting the framework for tomorrow's maritime education, what Vasily said, being a principal, an owner, and tomorrow's employer, right, for the young people that are being trained today, do you agree in what he said? And are you incorporating his ideas uh, into your new frame framework in terms of the various paths and the various specialties and the challenges that we need to face going forward? Okay, um, I will start saying that uh, what we're preparing actually is the institutional framework for uh, maritime education. Let's say the white paper, if you like, for maritime education. So mainly it concentrates on axles, on very important issues like uh, how one can enter in the, in the maritime profession, like uh, how can can get uh, the uh, certificates of competence, like uh, what do we need for personnel, uh, educational personnel? What do we need for laboratories? So it stays on axles and issues which are mainly uh, addressing institutional issues. Also, what kind of professional qualifications do they have when they come out of these academies, private or, or, uh, or, or public? And uh, also what kind of, uh, of um, treatment they will have after they get uh, their uh, certificates of competence. Now, uh, apart from that, uh, you said uh, uh, about the, uh, the, the, the required uh, educational material. Okay, yes, we enter in this area, but actually most of this is defined by the guidelines of international uh, agreements which actually we have to apply in our educational system so that we can follow uh, what is required internationally and what is required according to the uh, agreements, uh, the international agreements. Uh, we have also uh, our views and uh, these, uh, there are a lot of studies that have been carried out in the foundation concerning how we go for officers in the ships, either uh, in the uh, ship officers in the management or mechanical, but uh, what we are doing now is the institutional framework and then we will come up with the more specific uh, uh, description of the, if you like, of the curricula of the maritime uh, uh, education, both in the beginning and afterwards. Thank you, Professor Goyas. Tell me, Professor Akumanis, do you feel that this new institutional framework that is being put together will be equally, uh, will be equitable in terms of private and public education? I say this because historically in Greece, the debate between private and public education has been very long. And as we have all said, it is only recently that private facilities have been able to offer the types of, uh, especially shipboard education, that were only and exclusively offered by the public naval academies here in Greece. Or let me even ask you something else. I am sure that you, meaning the private education facilities, would like to have a say and contribute to this institutional framework. Are you doing so? It's, first of all, it's very encouraging to see the kind of neutral position that this government and the minister is taking concerning public versus uh, private maritime education. And it's uh, also ironic that on the higher level, on the university level, this is still not the case in Greece. Uh, but let me focus on what are the emerging requirements 
in Maritime Academy, which is the distinguishing factor. The infrastructure, the facilities, the laboratories that are needed in Maritime Academies these days to satisfy the incoming environmental regulations and the technological advances that are needed to satisfy these regulations are a critical point. And it's encouraging to see in, in a previous panel in this conference, the efforts that foundations are making to enhance and contribute to the infrastructure and the facilities of the public maritime academies. Very encouraging. On the private sector, like the Metropolitan College, has invested millions in order to have the most advanced simulation facilities and laboratories. And this is something that it's uh, nice to see that both public and private academies are determined either through their own resources or through support from foundations and individuals to reach a kind of similar uh, level of uh, infrastructure that is needed to educate the future uh, masters and engineers. The a point that I would like to, to add is that <laughs> if we consider the academic quality of the students entering the public or the private maritime academies, it's, it's similar. There are no major differences. The point is what you do, what you can do with this quality of students after they enter the Maritime Academy. How can you mentor, help them, provide them with lectures from important personalities in order to help them develop their potential? This is the issue. There's no difference in terms of the academic qualities of students. Uh, but it's what happens within the uh, period that they are educated in, in these maritime academies. And that should be the focus of raising not only the infrastructure, but also the, the academic credentials of the teaching staff. Because technology has moved quite a lot, and some of the teaching staff in the academies uh, are fully, are quite behind the uh, advances of LNG ships and LPG and the future fuels that are needed for shipping. Thank you. Professor Dombakis, I want to switch gears a bit. Um, apart from the academic training that you provide at CAS, uh, one of the advantages is the creation of relationships and common thinking for tomorrow's shipping business leaders. Um, is this important? Is it an integral part of what you do? It is extremely important. And I think we, we place a, a great emphasis on the practical side of things. The practical side being the relationship with the industry out there, the people from the industry. We place great value on our alumni who come back and get involved in teaching, in the classroom, in participating in events, in conferences, etc. I think it's very important to have this cross-fertilization. Yes, we provide some, uh, uh, if you like, seeds to develop ideas and create, if you like, the future thinking, but also it's the other way around. It's the people who have left us or people who are in the industry and were not associated with the business school who are happy to come back and talk to the current students. And I think it's extremely important. Otherwise, we're going to lock ourselves in an ivory tower, as they say, and be completely disassociated with reality. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, we are also vocational education. We can make say, call it academic, but it is not completely general in the way you would say general management or business or economics or something like that. It is focused on shipping, commodities, that sort of part of the world. Thank you. Then, Atiyah, I'm going to switch gears again with you. 40 years ago, women uh, in managerial and executive positions, positions in shipping companies, so shore base, were few and far apart. Today, that has changed a lot. 
Um, what has not changed is women at sea. I know that there was an earlier panel yesterday uh, that uh, created a strong debate between two uh, uh, ship owners. Um, so I don't want you to delve into too much because we don't have a lot of time. But um, have we done something wrong as an industry or are we okay with what we're doing? My dear George, uh, I truly thank you for this question. I think this is my beloved issue and most probably the story of my life. <laughs> Allow me to rephrase it a little bit. It's not what we are doing wrong. It's more of what we can do more and better. I strongly believe that this is a collective effort with all the parties involved and to be more specific. It's the shipping industry, it's the maritime administrations, it's the seafarers as an entity, and of course, international organizations and fora. IMO paved the way in 2019, dedicating the World Maritime Day to the women in shipping, aiming at raising awareness and of the global maritime community. Just to remain, uh, remember the, the words of the Secretary General, the maritime sector needs all hands on deck, male and female. It has been already recognized that women in the maritime world today are strong, powerful, and constantly challenging all functioned perceptions. Experience tell us that uh, diversity is better. It is better for teamwork, better for leadership, and better for commercial performance. Just few uh, successful examples of women uh, randomly picked. I can mention the executive director of the European Maritime Safety Agency, the president of BIMCO, the president of the World Maritime University, and so on. I, allow me to give some figures that are very important. Women form 39% of the global workforce. Women seafarers constitute only 2% of the total number of seafarers worldwide. In EMSA's report, July 2020, for, with EU data in two, of 2018, it is stated that the percentage of female masters and officers was approximately 2.22%, where compared to the 97.78%, of males, mas male masters and officers. So, Venetia, yeah. mm -hmm. I, will, I will interrupt you. Your answer is no, we're not doing enough. The answer <laughs> is that with collective effort, we should promote, we should find the ways to open our doors in the women. Of course, always taking into consideration that we need capacity, abilities, and skills. Imagine just that in Greece, we have today uh, uh, 1,153 young people enter the academies. You know how many were women? Very 136. 10%. You know what we did in Chaco's group? We opened doors to our vessels and offices. Our women officers of different nationalities have inspired to the whole hierarchy of the vessel. The strategy now is to focus in a right balance in cadets, deck, but, and then in department. Benedia, I will interrupt you, not because I want to interrupt you. We have maybe a minute or two left. We're not going to be able to cover all the topics. That's true. That's true. Question from a participant was, they're looking for jobs on ships they can't find them. I would tell them, and I think you all agree, go knock on doors, you'll find jobs. What yes. I want in one word from all of you is, tomorrow's best maritime profession. What is it? Professor Akumanis. In one word, two words, which path? A well-balanced uh, engineer. Vasilis. I would agree with Professor Arkumanis. There is a lot of uh, potential there. Professor Tampaitis. A technical background topped off with business education. Professor Golias. Sorry, you're on mute. Professor Golias, you're on mute. I would say both uh, at sea and at shore, and uh, whatever fits better to the uh, peculiarities of the professional who is going to choose the profession. There's no best for everyone. Benetia. Officers of the future depending on digital and grid skills. I agree with all of you. You're absolutely correct. Thank you very much. We're ended. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.